<coughs> killer whale, the top top predator. Some say killer whale, others say orca. Both are fine. Killer whale emphasizes their predatory nature and they sometimes kill large prey in dramatic and bloody fashion. Orca has come to represent the social, cultural and cognitively complex creature that has never, as far as we know, actually killed a human in the wild. These two sides of the same animal are closely related. They are such devastating predators because they are social, clever and cultural. And the evolution of their societies and intelligences has undoubtedly been driven at least partially by their predatory nature. There is another conundrum with the name killer whale. People see, describe and photograph killer whales all around the world. From within the leads that fracture pack ice near both poles to warm waters on the equator. All these animals are robust, medium-sized whales with the characteristically dramatic black and white markings and tall dorsal fins, huge dorsal fins in mature males. But there are differences among groups of killer whales. Some groups of animals are a little smaller, or their fins are a little pointier, or the characteristic white eye patch is reduced. Furthermore, there may be two or more of these morphological types in the same area. But the most interesting aspect of these differences is that these are not just morpho types, different body shapes. They are ecotypes, animals with different ways of life. Killer whales often eat in a most spectacularly visible way. For instance, a mink whale being torn apart or a seal being snatched from a beach. And even when foraging more cryptically, they may leave behind traces of their food. Compared with many cetaceans, we have a relatively good picture of killer whale diet. In a few situations, scientists following killer whales can be pretty certain they have observed every feeding event of each individual and so can make detailed quantitative studies of foraging behavior. And so we know that the different visually distinguishable types of killer whales eat characteristically different prey. Best studied and most well known are the killer whales of the Northwest Pacific where there are three of these ecotypes. The residents, which eat salmon and whose males have slightly forward tilted dorsal fins. The transients, which are a little larger, have pointed dorsal fins and eat marine mammals. And the offshores, which eat deep water fish, especially sharks. Two or more ecotypes may use the same waters but not in the same way. In the Northeast Atlantic, there seem to be at least two ecotypes, one that specializes in hunting cetaceans, and the other smaller, type 2, that has a more generalized diet. In the, in the Antarctic, the orca ecotype situation is becoming increasingly baroque. There seem to be at least five ecotypes, with perhaps more to come. Type A specializes on mink whales, the pack ice killer whale on seals, and the gerlache killer whale on penguins, while the Ross Sea killer whale and sub-Antarctic killer whale appear to eat fish. What is going on here with all these killer whale ecotypes? Are they species or subspecies or races or... <coughs> At first glance, the presence of a range of killer whale ecotypes does not seem that unusual. Lots of animal species, wolves and coyotes for example, come in somewhat different ecotypes that eat somewhat different things. But generally, they develop these variations in different places. And so geographical barriers allow for independent ecological, morphological, and fundamentally evolutionary trajectories in the different groups of animals. 
Sometimes the barriers are breached, perhaps because of geological processes, the landing of a land bridge, for instance, an unusual migration or human intervention. And the types start being found together, retaining their differences because successful breeding only occurs within types. But it was the barriers that allowed the differences to develop. However, killer whales don't face much in the way of barriers. Individuals swim thousands of kilometers all over the oceans, encountering killer whales of other ecotypes. Yet the differences between the ecotypes are profound. New genetic studies show that the maternal lineages of these ecotypes have been well separated for many, many generations, with very little, if any, interbreeding. Geneticist Philip Morin and his colleagues believe that there are multiple species of killer whale out there. So, how did this happen? Lansbury Leonard, a researcher based at the Vancouver Aquarium, has spent a lot of time pondering killer whale evolution. He has also spent a lot of time at sea with the animals themselves. He thinks the keys to their evolutionary diversification lie in three powerful killer whale traits. They are picky eaters, they are xenophobic, and they are cultural. While the killer whales of the world eat a very wide variety of prey, from blue whales to stingrays to herring, each individual killer whale and each ecotype of killer whales has a much more restricted diet and sticks to it with remarkable persistence. This was graphically illustrated in 1970 when three mammal-eating transient whales were captured alive off British Columbia for the display industry. They were kept in a netted pen and fed fish like the resident whales that were usually captured. At that time, no one knew that there were different ecotypes of killer whale. For 75 days, they were provided with fish, but refused them. One died. Four days later, the other two began to eat the fish, but they reverted to mammal food on being returned to the wild after a few months of captivity. The pickiness goes beyond general types of food, such as fish or mammal. The resident killer whales of the eastern North Pacific focus on Chinook salmon and are sufficiently disdainful of other salmon species that during the 1990s, when the Chinook salmon population declined, so did that of the resident killer whales, even though other salmon species were reasonably plentiful. The Antarctic pack ice killer whales specialize in using waves that they make to dislodge seal prey from ice floes. This is the way that they catch most of their food. However, they often spy hop around the ice floe first to make sure the victim is their preferred species, the Weddell seal. Crab eater seals, about half the size of the Weddell, but otherwise pretty similar, are consistently spared. Crab eaters from about 83% of the regional seal population, whales just 15%. The peakiness extends to parts of prey. Killer whales that eat baleen whales often just eat the tongue and lips, and the garlash killer whales, when eating relatively tiny penguins, often discard all of the carcass except the preferred breast muscles. Killer whales brought into captivity retain this pickiness, unwilling to try unfamiliar food. Selectivity about food is a general killer whale trait, and Barrett Le Leonard argues is part of their overall cultural conservatism. Barrett Leonard's second characteristic killer whale trait, xenophobia, is harder to document. However, in the eastern North Pacific, the different Ecotypes either studiously ignore or go, or go to some lengths to avoid one another. This description from John Ford and Graham Ellis's authoritative book on the mammal eating transients illustrates the evidence. <clears throat> Seeing residents and transients in the same vicinity is not a common occurrence, but it has been witnessed often enough by ourselves and our colleagues so that a pattern is starting to emerge. 
Either the two forms pass as if neither notices the other, or the transients actively avoid encountering the residents. In cases of avoidance, transients on a collision course with a part of residence deviate from their path and skirt around the residence or reverse their course in order to stay clear. We have noticed on occasion that transients begin to take evasive action once the underwater vocalizations of an approaching group of residents become audible at a range of a few kilometers or so. As transients are most often silent when they travel and forage, they may typically go undetected by the larger, vociferous resident pods. Meetings between the ecotypes are therefore rare events, but they have been observed. And the details of one event bear repeating here because they speak so powerfully to the concept of xenophobia in killer whale societies, which in turn speaks to an as aspect of culture that pervades human societies. The way individuals identify with their own in-group, which can be recognized by completely arbitrary symbolic markers, and prefer them to any individuals or groups identified as other. Ford and Ellis describe an encounter that started with Ellis receiving a phone call about killer whales in Naimo Bay on Vancouver Island, which was their cue to get aboard their boat and try to collect some data. They soon encountered the whales and recognized them as belonging to a well-known resident group, J-Pod. Soon after encountering the group, the whales began porpoising, swimming at high speed, toward Descano Bay, some two miles distant at the northwest end of Gabriola Island. Grammy Ellis ran ahead to investigate where the J pod whales were headed at such speed, and as he approached the small bay, he sighted more whales, which were creating a, a great deal of splashing in the water. Moments later, Grammy arrived in Descano Bay to find more of J-Pod in a tight group and they appeared to be in a very excited state. Shortly thereafter, these were joined by the previous J-Group, still travelling at high speed. At 11am, as the whales began to charge together toward the head of the bay, a group of three transient whales, T-20, T-21, and T-22 suddenly surfaced a few meters ahead of the residents. The transients were clearly fleeing from the larger resident group, and it appeared that the residents were attempting to drive the transients toward and possibly onto the beach. All the whales were extremely agitated and intense vocalizations were clearly audible through the hull of the boat, even over the noise of the outboard motor. Grammy observed what appeared to be fresh teeth marks on T20's dorsal fin and T22's flank. All ages and both sexes of the resident whales seemed to be involved in the fray. Just as the whales drew near a ferry dock located along the shore, a ferry backed out of its slip and disrupted the interaction. The transient group immediately drove and surfaced near the far side of the bay, followed by the J-Pod whales about 200 meters behind. About five minutes later, the transients left the bay and swam steadily south, with the Js following slowly several hundred meters behind. At 11.35 am, the transients were running away, went through Dodd Narrows, a small tidal channel leading to the south, but J-Pod did not follow. Instead, they milled about for 25 minutes. When they were finally joined by the female J-17 and her newborn calf, J-28, who had not been present during the earlier altercation with the transients. The degree of antagonism between the groups described here is extraordinary. After all, these animals eat different things, so they can't be competitors for the same resources. The most efficient thing to do from a natural selection perspective would be to simply ignore each other and minimize the risk of injury associated with this kind of confrontation. There must be something more going on. And Barrett Leonard suggests it is xenophobia.